Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend Orville Schell, who's the head of the U.S.-China program at the Asia Society. He's the author, along with John DeLury, of Wealth and Power, a wonderful book about China. And I would encourage you to go to the INET website and revisit the interview that we did on video together when that book was released. Orville is also working on a new novel, which will come out with by Alfred Knopp, uh, probably around the turn of the year, on China, called My Old Home. Orville has recently written an article called The End of Engagement, about the U.S.-China relationship, and reading that article inspired me to call you, and thank you for joining me today. I think our listeners have a lot to learn from the kind of thoughts that you've been creating. It will be fun. So, Arbel, it's near the end of June 2020. The pandemic is here. We're watching all kinds of stresses in economy, stresses with regard to health, concern about whether collaboration and climate change will be, uh, how I say, made more difficult by these things. And you, a specialist in understanding China and its relationship to the United States, and you, I know you've done work with the governor of California on climate change. I'm, I just want to open wide up. What are you seeing? What is really going on inside China itself, and uh, how are we going to how are we going to address the kind of challenges that you wrote about with the end of engagement? Well, what's so striking to me, Rob, is that uh, you know after all of these decades of following um, the U.S. China relationship, at this time when when we have a, this confluence of a whole stream of other uh, extraordinarily stressful problems assaulting us. We also find that we are at the end of a period of almost a half a century of a framework that did manage to keep uh, the U.S. and China in a reasonably uh, constructive uh, and increasingly engaged uh, mode. And that was very striking and, and, and quite extraordinary given the fact that uh, you know, China is a Marxist-Leninist system with a completely different uh, political uh, structure and value system. And yet, since 1972, when uh, Kissinger and, and Nixon uh, went to China and forged that, that partnership uh, with Mao Zedong and, and Zhou Enlai, uh, the two countries have managed to coexist and even to become much more interconnected. Uh, and that was, a, I think, looking back on it, uh, a, a rather um, you know, extraordinary accomplishment. So we're left to ask at this point now, when I think it's fair to say that engagement is essentially over as a framework. And we, it happens precisely when we're being hit by a pandemic an economic uh, depression, and, and a whole myriad other uh, things. Wh why did that happen? And who's, who's responsible for that sorry end? Um, I would have to say that, you know, as you look back over the decades before, which I did in writing this article, The Death of Engagement, I went back into a lot of archives, read a lot of books, papers, you know, whatnot. The thing that really really impressed me uh, was the degree to which the United States, over a period of eight presidential administrations, almost every single president, didn't matter if they came in raging against, you know, the butchers from Beijing to Baghdad or, you know, against communism, they all came out trying to support engagement, trying to steady the course and to keep the United States committed to interacting with China under the supposition that China would slowly uh, uh, change, it would slowly become integrated into the global marketplace, and it might even become more uh, comfortable within the whole 
outside world of liberal democratic values. So why did that end? And, uh, you know, what, even more important, what's going to replace it? And mm -hmm. now that question, of course, is the most critical question of all, because we see that as China drifts into a much more aggressive and assertive posture, places like in India and, and Australia and, and around the world, you know, we're left to ask, how are we going to get along with the second largest economy? the most populous nation in the world uh, without any real uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, a clear uh, framework and an operating system. Well, this, uh, this breakdown is quite daunting. And I guess my tendency would be to go inside each of the countries and understand what were the forces that are tearing it apart? You uh, have a much more experienced and deeper lens into the inner workings of China. What are, where, what are some of the clues? What are some of the elements that you see that what you might call illuminate the stresses that are bringing this breakdown to the surface? Well, that really is the question of questions. And I think uh, one might sort of analyze it this way. That, of course, when China began its whole developmental process back in the late 1970s, as it came out of the Maoist period and, and Deng Xiaoping started the period of, of, of openness and reform, uh, the key elements were uh, economic reform and secondarily, uh, people also around the world hope that political reform would also also follow. Um, and as that, that evolution uh, continued uh, through the 80s, uh, there were some extraordinary uh, changes that, that did, in fact, uh, uh, grip China and did transform it in very significant ways. But then what happened? 1989 and the Beijing massacre. And that really, sadly, in retrospect, I have to say, and I was there during most of it, and, and I felt in many ways it was completely justified what people were asking for, but it did put a stake through the heart of the Communist Party's comfort level with the idea of reform, because suddenly they thought, if you let reform go, this is what you get, a million people in the center of your capital city, embarrassing you, humiliating you, and bringing everything to a, a grinding halt. So that, that put a huge break on the whole uh, uh, process of, of, of reform within China. And that meant that as China developed economically, it was much less inclined to actually change the structures of its economy, and certainly not its body politic. And it, created a situation where the playing field with countries like the United States and the EU, uh, particularly uh, uh, in, uh, in, in markets, became more and more out of le level as China developed. So the inequities rose. Uh, China continued to act as if it were a developing country. It, ex it was very protectionist, excluded uh, foreign companies from many parts of its markets where it was welcomed almost around the full compass rose and in, in, in outside of China. But this created an inequity, a lack of reciprocity, an unlevel playing field that became comp uh, increasingly less to tolerable. And of course, Obama recognized this, and that's what the pivot to Asia was all about under him. The people like Kurt Campbell uh, uh, sort of wrote that kind of uh, uh, document. And then along came Trump, who in his, in his very sort of uh, uh, animal way, always knows when he's being taken or when he's being uh, deceived or not being treated right. And he looked at the relationship and in many ways he got it wrong, but in certain ways he got it right. And he said, this isn't working. It's not fair. It's not reciprocal. It's not level. And I'm not gonna take it anymore. And so then you got both sides uh, in, in a state of, 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 of antagonism over how to level the playing field. And that's where we are, that's where we are today. So that 
uh, really, I think, puts most of the burden on China for not recognizing that to play this game, to be in the engagement process, required that it keep reforming and that it, it as it molted out of its developmental phases uh, as, a, as a country that was uh, n not advanced, it, it, it had to also uh, be more reciprocal. I mean, just look at certain things like w w the whole areas in China where American companies or European companies are completely excluded, you know, information technology. There isn't an IT company in America that can actually operate openly in, in China. You know, you don't, can't have websites, you can't have platforms, you can't have this, you can't have that. Uh, I mean, there are myriad others, of course, where, where uh, the playing field is not level. And so we're reaping that bitter harvest now. And then we got... Uh, President Trump as a president who recognized the problem and set about trying to do something about it, but in many ways, uh, quite ineptly, I think. Yeah, I, I look at the, uh, you know, many people acted like at some level Trump created this, and I think that's a little too convenient. My, own, my own look at the United States... I could see Silicon Valley companies feeling blocked. I could see knowledge intensive companies engaging in foreign direct investment in China and thinking they would have access to an enormous economies of scale through a market. And then they watched what you might call the transfer of technology to domestic firms who became favored and they lost out. I saw Wall Street anticipating a deepening and modernization of the capital markets in China, and then a global integration uh, of the renminbi into the foreign exchange system. And that was thwarted. So looking, and, and then finally, the traditional companies, the Nikes, the Walmarts, and others, started to experience profit compression because the Chinese, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, started to want to raise the wages of their people and improve the environmental standards. So some of these things are good, some of the things are not. And when people saw the China 2025 design, which was about displacing things at the upper end of the value chain, I, I just think the what you might call the, that raw, hard political economy within the United States said, this doesn't look like comparative advantage. This doesn't look like us working together in making people better off here and there and, you know, what they would call the gains from trade. And so I, I and I, you'd mentioned Kurt Campbell and uh, another gentleman named Blackwell at the CFR. We're writing about this in late 2014, early 2015, which is before Donald Trump's campaign took off. So I think that, I think the forces were mounting and, the only place where I would agree with Chinese leaders who I've met with uh, is that they say China is large scale. It's not the size of Tonga. It's four or five times the size of the United States. And so as they begin to develop, globalization is going to create substantial adjustment and displacement everywhere else in the world, primarily meaning the advanced countries of Europe and the United States and, and Japan. And when they say that, they're saying essentially who was guilty was American political economy, which used the power of the new profits of the winning sectors to lobby Washington to keep their money offshore to limit infrastructure, to not play, pay trade adjustment assistance or retraining on an adequate scale. And then when the many people in America were in despair, which contributed to Trump's election, they wanted to blame China. And the Chinese leaders say, we were powerful, powerless in the adjustment assistance process, but we understand it was coming because of the scale 
and the intensity of, of China's development. So I, I can see I can see pressures on both sides and failures on both sides. But that's where we are now. <laughs> it's, yes. it, and, and I and, think the, the striking thing, Rob, is that if you look at the goodwill that uh, really was uh, all around the Compass Rose in, let's say, the 1980s, and even in the 1990s under Jiang Zemin when Clinton came. Remember, Clinton came into power talking about the butchers of Baghdad to Beijing, and he came out a really... A really close ally of Jiang Zemin, and I went on that trip in 1998 to China with him, and mm-hmm. I've never seen uh, such a kind of a close, uh, sort of friendly accord uh, between a U.S. And, and, and Chinese leader. But what happened after that was quite striking. Uh, one by one, China managed to alienate constituencies within the United States. I mean, it, it lost the church, it lost the military. It lost academics by, you know, harassing them and not letting, giving them visas, not letting them into archives. It lost journalists. Uh, it, and then the last group that it lost of consequence was the one group in America that really was the heart and soul of the engagement uh, uh, process as functional, and that was the businessmen. And I remember mm-hmm. three, four years ago, you began to hear, uh, all the chambers of commerce starting to be increasingly negative about, uh, you know, reporting the, the the sentiments of their their members within China, and that that continued uh, to become much more uh, uh, sort of critical. And when the businessmen were lost, then China really had no one in the United States supporting uh, the idea uh, that engagement was a functional, ongoing. Uh, you know, process that would would ultimately bring us, make us more convergent rather than divergent. So that's that was the tragedy, and that's where we are now. Uh, we are very closely intertwined in terms of supply chains and and, and in terms of uh, uh, sort of economics and trade, and yet increasingly, we feel divided in every other way. And moreover, we don't have any of the kind of, uh, you know, big timber leadership that might wrench this thing around in some fundamental way through some dramatic readjustment or, or, or recalibration. And so we're, we find ourselves in a very dangerous spiral downward that is being reinforced by economic forces, political forces, military forces, human rights forces, and geopolitical forces. Uh, uh, forces around the globe. What, what's interesting to me is when I've met, I've never met Xi Jinping, but I've met most of the other top people in China repeatedly, is that these are not unstudied, uneducated, unaware people. They are very sophisticated people. Why are they behaving this way? As a country, what is what is going on that's driving their leadership, and particularly Xi Jinping, in this aggressive direction? So this is a really important question to pose because if you look around the world, you find a very striking tableau of countries which once were seemingly unimaginable uh, in terms of being in, in some state of antagonism with China. And are now been pushed to 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 a position where, uh, you know, they're they're very skeptical about China and, and increasingly view it as a threat. I mean, look at a country like Sweden, you know, the sort of uh, ne plus ultra of neutralism. Well, the Chinese have hectored and bullied Sweden to the point where they are very alienated. They did this to Norway over Liu Xiaobo, the uh, Nobel P, uh, Nobel. Uh, 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 prize winner. Uh, and they sort of penalize Norway and salmon imports and whatnot. Look at what's happened in Australia. Uh, this country is very dependent on Chinese markets, on grain, uh, beef, iron ore. And yet, because of inept Chinese diplomacy and intrusiveness into, Chinese, into Australian politics, uh, etc., uh, we now find the Australian government in a 
very sort of antagonistic relationship with, uh, with China. And there, there are many other examples. India, uh, just of late, with the Aksai Chin uh, Ladakh border feuds, uh, India now is being sort of driven out of any kind of state of, uh, of being, you know, a non aligned country. So you have to ask yourself why is China doing this? Uh, what does it gain? The South China Sea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the way they treated Korea after the Thad missile, uh, brouhaha. Well, I think, you know, two things. Are, suggest themselves as answers. One uh, is that the sense that China's current leaders have that the U.S. is in decline has given them a kind of a, 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 an unrealistic sense of their own omnipotence and their own power, almost like a, a, a tragic, a Greek tragedy in which the hero, overweening ambition and hubris, overreaches and uh, comes a cropper. Uh, so there's that element. And there's also, I think, in someone like Xi Jinping, you have to remember that he is a quite able leader. Uh, and you see that in the way he's managed to inculcate such an incredible state of sort of Leninist discipline within China. But he is not a very cosmopolitan man. He has never been abroad does not speak a foreign language, and I think fundamentally doesn't feel particularly comfortable in global company, and we now live in a global world. He goes to Davos, but he doesn't mix. And if you look at other leaders, uh, there was much more sort of spontaneity and openness. John Zemin and Clinton I've alluded to, but Deng Xiaoping, who had been to France, uh, and Jimmy Carter, and Zhou Enlai, who had also been to France and Russia with Kissinger and Nixon, but not Xi Jinping. So I think in a certain sense, she is a person who is rather hermetically raised in China and, and is probably uh, uh, someone who does not feel very comfortable and secure in dealing with uh, uh, sort of global leadership circles in a way that outside leaders are accustomed to. And thus he relies on, on, on ritual, on formality, uh, and you know, sort of structured uh, ceremony. Uh, and that, of course, makes it very difficult to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to wrench fundamental problems back into a state of equilibrium. Yeah. Well, the uh, interesting thing uh, from my perspective is I would have thought as China and the United States were at loggerheads that various other places, Africa, Europe, other countries in Asia, India in particular, and Australia, they would be seeking to fortify their relations with. But isn't it, at least as I'm following the news, it seems like those frontiers are antagonistic as well. Yeah, I think, you know, it's very uh, important to kind of do an assay of, of sort of major players around the world and what are the trend lines in terms of their relations with China. Uh, despite the fact you know, that Trump is quite inept and is leaving a tremendous leadership vacuum in the world. The striking thing is the degree to which uh, Xi Jinping and China are nonetheless alienating one country after another. So it's almost as if Trump and Xi are in a race to see who can do the worst job in terms of uh, uh, weaving a global fabric of allies uh, and uh, together in their own national interest. So, I mean, I've mentioned a, a few of the countries around the world where, where uh, China has been alienating people. But if you look at Europe, which remember Europe has no security issue in Asia the way the US does. It doesn't have a seventh fleet. It doesn't have an alliance structure. And we have that with Japan, Korea, Australia, to some degree with the Philippines, they're a technical treaty ally. And we have an increasingly close relationship with countries like Vietnam and even, even Singapore. China uh, or Europe does not have that. 
There, there are no boats out there. There's no responsibilities. Their relationship with China is pretty much strict trade. And yet, one country after another, you see them uh, looking increasingly at China as some kind of a threat. Uh, and you, you notice this particularly in their relation to the issue of 5G and Huawei. And whether they feel comfortable with their countries adopting Huawei, Huawei 5G infrastructure. And we see now even people like Boris Johnson. I mean, remember in, in Britain, the golden era and, and Cameron when, uh, you know, Britain and China were going to waltz off into the future. That's gone. And you find people like Boris Johnson initiating what he's called the 10D, the 10 democracies, to get together to to figure out a way to, to meet the China challenge. You see in the EC, the EU, uh, 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 Joseph Borrell, who's the head of the China committee, increasingly looking at China as, a, as something that needs to be countered, not just embraced and collaborated with. Even Merkel and Germany, you see this, the Czech Republic, a quite interesting turn of the worm there. And you have the prime minister of Denmark saying, uh, we shouldn't take Huawei 5G in Denmark. We should take it from a friendly company, country. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense to deal with a, a country that, that has a different political system and different values on such a fundamental technological level. So it's really interesting to look at the way, uh, you know, the lights are turning on all around the world in terms of a greater awareness and a greater sense of, of, of caution about being too deeply involved with China, particularly on matters of, of national security, such as 5G. Mm -hmm. Well, I see, uh, I mentioned earlier, the vision of economies of scale. I remember in the 70s, people talking about Pepsi and Coke having a billion two customers and things like that. Uh, what I'm hearing now from people I know in the tech sector is China's playing a hand of cards where Huawei gets to be building the infrastructure all over the world. But the Chinese market is closed to just them. So they can cross subsidize with the profits they make with monopoly power at home in order to uh, what you might call undermine competition in the other parts of the world. That I, I can't imagine why other countries would stand for that. Well, I think that that's precisely the plan. That if you can uh, shut IT companies out of China and give their national champions like Huawei, the run of the pen, then they can build up, uh, you know, tremendous amounts of, uh, of profit and R&D and then go abroad and occupy key uh, technological sectors. Uh, and then in a certain sense, the world will be Chinese. You, you logically have asked, why would this be sustainable or acceptable? And I think the answer is it shouldn't be. And it isn't. And what is so interesting to me as I watch this now uh, is to see one country after another asking the very question that you've asked and coming up with a question, uh, an answer to that question, which is we need, we need another, uh, a, a, another uh, sort of uh, a way forward. We, and so what, where does that leave them? Well, not with tremendously much. There's Ericsson. There's Nokia in Europe. Qualcomm makes the chips in this country. Uh, what we really need, if we are serious about competing with China and not letting China into sectors where national security might be threatened, such as IT, we need some sort of a collaboration among these companies, which I think will take some sort of state-to-state -state, uh, subsidy. Uh, because if we are going to have an answer to Huawei, which does base stations, it does the works, uh, we've got to really get with it or Huawei is going to win. So this is a kind of a metaphor for the comp competition that is, uh, is, is building between China and other countries, particularly the U.S., particularly in the areas where security really matters, like IT. 
And I guess we always uh, in the United States hear about the Asian region and uh, military confrontation around various islands and so forth. What what's happening in the explicit military realm? Is is China acting in an aggressive manner there, or is it more commercially aggressive rather than uh, militarily aggressive in this context? Well, sad to say uh, that if it was just a a commercial, just a market uh, competition uh, dilemma uh, between China and the world, that might be manageable. Where we really have uh, danger zones are uh, in the South China Sea, uh, Hong Kong to some degree, although it's doubtful that that, that that could be caused for any military intervention, but certainly Taiwan, and the East China Sea, where the Japanese uh, have administrative control over the Sengaku Islands, the Chinese call them the Diaoyudao, uh, and uh, they're not about to give them up, and China is very aggressively uh, sort of challenging Japanese control there. Those three areas are the areas where we could very, very easily have a military dust up, which could lead to some larger conflict. So if it was just a question of, uh, you know, technology and, and market competition and et cetera, et cetera, that would be one thing. But you add an overlay of this very assertive, aggressive, forward military posture of China uh, in these other areas, uh, and you have a very inflammatory situation. And remember, in the South China Sea, the so-called nine-dash line, China basically claims the entire South China Sea as its own. It goes, it's like a giant uh, cow udder that comes down from South China and Hainan Island all the way down to Indonesia, to the Natuna Islands off Indonesia, sweeps down the Vietnamese coast, down the Malaysian coast to Singapore, up Borneo, all right skirts along the Philippines. And these are some of the most uh, uh, important fishing grounds and possibly, uh, uh, you know, petroleum, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, tracks uh, in the region. So this is really dangerous stuff. And China's built islands, built military bases, and um, shows no sign of willing to uh, uh, trim its jib or make any kind of accommodation to anybody. So if you were advising, we'll call it the next American administration, we'll call it the Biden administration, we have this whole constellation of difficulties, and yet on the horizon, we have a dangerous challenge related to climate. How would you advise an administration incoming in, no, or I guess on January of next year, to approach? necessary collaboration with China on environmental issues? Well, it's interesting you raise the question of the environmental challenge, because that is, in fact, the great common interest that, whether we care to acknowledge it or not, binds us to China. And it is infinitely more compelling, in my view, than the challenge the Soviet Union posed the two countries in 1972 when Kissinger and Nixon went, and they buried the hatchet in order to ally against the Soviet Union. Uh, it's also interesting to note that right now, there is a real threat to the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River. There's, all, there's a, a very torrential rains and very high level, uh, levels of, of, of river flow uh, in the area uh, of South China that is putting the Three Gorges Dam in enormous jeopardy. If that dam were to ever go, it would wipe out many cities downstream, including Shanghai. And it would be one of the great, great uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, disasters of, of history. So that highlights the importance of climate change. 
So is it possible to get together around these areas where we do have a common interest like the pandemic, but we show no evidence whatsoever of being able to collaborate on this recent uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic? So what should Biden do? Well, I mean, in many ways, Biden is well suited uh, to try to have a, a major new sort of global initiative to reformulate the, uh, uh, the, the to, to, to recalibrate the operating system between China, the US and the world. Because when he was vice president, uh, it was he who hosted uh, Xi Jinping in, in America when he came here on a trip. And I went on that trip and watched them interact. And in many ways, Biden was the perfect antidote to, to Xi Jinping's very formal, ritualistic, ceremonial uh, manner, never giving away much, no backslapping, no glad handing. And then uh, Xi Jinping invited Biden to China, and he went back. And I thought it was one of Obama's great mistakes that he didn't appoint uh, Biden, the China guy at a high level as vice president, but he didn't do it. So anyway, he, if he were to come into office, I think he would be in a very good position to say, listen, this is one of the, the truly dangerous moments in history when two great powers are sliding ineluctably toward an, an increasingly adversarial relationship. We must do some big power effort to arrest that, 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 that whole downward slide and try to create some other way of interacting, particularly around the questions that you've just uh, noted, like climate change, like pandemics, like nuclear proliferation. Would it work? I'm not particularly optimistic, but I do think it is definitely worth a try. And I think, uh, I don't know whether China is at this point capable of responding in a spontaneous enough, open enough, innovative enough way. I don't see that particularly in Xi Jinping's MO, uh, but I think it is something that Biden would know how to do. He should do. He might even appoint someone like Bill Clinton to try to go and, and, re and kick this thing around into a different a frame. Uh, who would China appoint to match Clinton? That's the question. There isn't anyone besides Xi Jinping. So I don't know what will happen, but I do think that if Biden gets elected, that's essential. And I, I think it probably is on his, his agenda. So uh, I want to go back a little bit to your book, Wealth and Power. Because it seems to me, at least in my own way of seeing, that that book described a woundedness that derived from being a middle kingdom, a great leader of civilization, and then being humiliated as a result, first of the Opium Wars vis-a-vis -vis Great Britain, and then the Japanese invasion in the night during the second world war uh what what would free xi jinping or his ruling coalition to feel like they experienced national what I'll call resurrection and dignity in the context of collaboration. Because if they're fighting, which you might call those scar tissues, those ghosts, it makes it even harder to see the benefits of collaboration that seem to be right, potentially right in front of us. Yes, I mean, I think you've used a very apt metaphor here, scar tissue. Uh, and I think we have to remember that, uh, you know, part of the whole, an essential element in the whole Chinese communist ideology, which began back in the 20, 1920s, was China as a victim. China as a hapless, helpless, supine uh, power that had broken down and collapsed, being preyed upon by the great powers. And they had this notion of a hundred years of humiliation. 
uh, and that is very deeply ingrained, uh, I think, in the in the sort of genetic code of China a, a, as a culture and the way it looks on the world. And of course, this is what Xi Jinping's China dream is all about uh, rectifying, and his notion of a rejuvenation of China. This word in Chinese, fu xing that to rejuvenate China, this is the heart and soul of what he, he wants to uh, uh, bring about. And in many ways, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that China has accomplished this rejuvenation. It's extraordinary what the Chinese uh, people, and one would have to say, to, to give credit where credit's due, the Chinese Communist Party has accomplished by way of, uh, of uh, development in, in China. But what is so striking about that success is that it hasn't translated into any less of a sense of victimhood. And in fact, the old ideology of anti-imperialism and victimization and humiliation uh, continues on to be the predominant party ideology, even as they have this incredibly a startling, historic, never equaled in the history of the world success. And mm -hmm. the tragedy of that is that you cannot be uh, successful and a victim at the same time. So in a certain sense, China's insistence on maintaining its victim culture uh, denies it, it the very sense of successfulness and accomplishment that it deserves. And this is a this is a real problem, and this is where history, you know, is so important. You just can't erase history. It's very hard to get rid of history, and history keeps barking and biting in China in ways that really, I think, distort and corrupt China's ability to to see itself in a new way as a successful great power rather than as a still victimized. Uh, you know, uh, uh, used to be known as the poor man of Asia, right? The, the, and and mm -hmm. sort of humiliating uh, uh, moniker. So this is a dilemma. History is still sort of making Chinese see themselves in a way that doesn't comport with the actual state of grace of their country. Well, and on the, the other side of what I'll call the narcissus pool, you see the United States, which has been the world leader, the principal architect for many, many years, and uh, China, very large and growing, increasingly powerful country, is not emulating all aspects of the American system and folding into our world system design. So I, I, I guess I'd say... Uh, from the pride of having been number one, America may have some uh, digestive difficulties yeah. with the need to express national identity. Yeah, isn't that it is isn't so it, important to the Chinese? I know. Isn't it? Isn't it strange that you have both of these great, great accomplished powers competing to, in a way, to see who can be the biggest victim? <laughs> I mean, you know, Trump blaming the virus on the Chinese. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, you know, why not just beat the virus at home and show them what a superior country we are because we can, we can do it instead of blaming someone. So we're in a kind of a weird historical period where all of the great powers are feeling victimized, filled with grievances. I mean, look at, the, look at Russia. That's another grievance culture. And, yeah. and it's very odd that nobody's able to enjoy their own accomplishments and still is, instead is insisting on blaming someone else for the things that they haven't been able to do. And we're into this very masochistic world of self-flagellation. And uh, it's all quite extraordinary because it throws the whole global compact off into the world of psychology and puts it right on Freud's couch rather than, <laughs> you know, in the World Trade Organization or the UN. And it's a psychological issue in some deeply fundamental way that we are completely unprepared to analyze or deal with. Yeah, I think we need to go back to the spirits of Joseph Campbell and C.G. Jung to uh, 
help us unravel this puzzle. Well, I mean, I think, Rob, this is why when you get right down to it, it's all well and good to be a policy specialist and to be in a think tank and walk away. But actually, a lot of these issues that, that we're dealing with are ones that are all too human. And this is why mm -hmm. I constantly go back and read Greek tragedy, because in many ways, I think what we see acting out, being acted out today, is a kind of a tragedy of human weakness and human frailty rather than of bad policy or lack of rational insight. Yeah, and I, uh, I guess, well, I remember, I think it was you, it was your son, Ollie, that suggested to me watching a movie that he said was growing in leaps and bounds in China and people were singing the national anthem on the closing credits called Wolf Warrior Two. Oh boy. I mean, hasn't that become the, uh, you know, the text of the, of the moment? Yes. Especially as pertains to Africa. Yes. The, and, and, uh, and, and what's the wolf warrior all about? It's about the most simple minded antidote to being a victim. You turn into yes. it's it's opposite. You turn into a belligerent bully. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but I remember that film and and the energy that it generated, the box office energy. I think it's like the third or fourth highest box office film ever, largely because of the enthusiasm inside of China. But I found it, just the whole storyline. Uh, how would I say the victim's revenge and turning into a superhero? Yes, uh, I mean I think you can you could say uh, if you if you trying to f understand why China is acting as assertively, aggressively, and belligerently as it is, then in in a, in a kind of a very sad and tragic way, it its own era of being bullied by superpowers taught it that when you become a superpower yourself, one of the hallmarks of that arrival is that you yeah. get to bully too. You get to have some colonial people, some Tibetans, some Uyghurs, and you throw your weight around the world, just as British gunboat diplomacy did back in the Opium War. And so we, we, we may be in a period where, strangely, we're, 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 you know, we're, winnowing, we're, we're reaping a bitter harvest uh, of yes. our own great pa power malfeasance that China is now acting out that script itself. It's something that Freud explicitly, Sigmund Freud, referred to as identification with the aggressor. Yes. Meaning well, when someone has pushed you down, the way you feel good is by doing to others what made you feel humiliated. Yes, I mean, the great Chinese writer Lu Xun always said that, you know, the, the relationship between slave and master was not uh, a, a, a contradiction or opposite. It was two sides of the same proposition. And that when the slave becomes the master, it's all too easy to adopt the master's predatory uh, uh, behavior. And there, there is a bit of that going on, I think, right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a whole lot that sits on the horizon before us. And a lot of what you've unpacked today should give people insight into the complexity, the degree, and the difficulty of the challenges that are on the horizon. And I hope after a few months pass, maybe after a presidential election, you and I can get back together again, take stock of where things have evolved to, and provide another chapter to this podcast. But for now, I really just want to thank you for being here today and for uh, helping us all dig in and understand. And I want to encourage everybody to watch the work that you do in the U.S.-China program at the, at the Asia Society, and obviously to pre-order your novel as soon as we can 
find it at Knopf's website or Amazon or wherever. But uh, thanks, Orville. It's always great to talk with you. And uh, as I mentioned, when Wealth and Power came out, we did a video together on the INET website so that people can, uh, I'll put that link up on associated with our, our podcast. But uh, my best to you and your family. I wish I could see you out in Bolinas, but I'm stuck here in New York. But I'm not stuck when I get to talk to great people like you. Well, thanks, Thank Rob. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, as always. Thanks. All right. All right cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.